of events, cause and effect. We analyse what went right and what went wrong as we discover that many outcomes can be predicted, planned for and even prevented. I'm John Chidgy and this is Causality. This episode is brought to you by Clubhouse, the very first project management platform for software development that brings everyone on every team together to build better products. Visit this URL, clubhouse or oneword.io slash 10 the word for more information. We'll talk more about them during the show. Causality is part of the Engineered Network. To support our shows, including this one, head over to our Patreon page and for other great shows, visit engineered.network today. Hotel New World. Critically Stable. On Saturday morning, the 15th of March, 1986, the Lian Yuk Building, which was the home to the Hotel New World in Singapore, collapsed, killing 33 people. It was the worst structural collapse in the country's history. The building itself was located at 305 Serangoon Road at the intersection with Owen Road, proximate to the suburb of Novena. The building construction began in 1969 and was completed in 1971, It was a concrete frame structure with 36 concrete support pillars connected by concrete beams and concrete floor slabs. It had a total of six above-ground floors with a single basement-level car park. The building's design was of a relatively standard construction technique and was essentially unremarkable to all outward appearances. The industrial and commercial bank occupied the ground-level floor. The Universal Neptune nightclub and restaurant occupied the second floor. And New Serangoon Hotel, later renamed the Hotel New World in 1984, occupied the top three floors of the building. The building was owned by Lian Yak Realty Company Private Limited. The building had experienced an incident in 1975 when a carbon monoxide gas leak poisoned 35 people. However, No one had suffered any long-term ill effects and there were no fatalities. Other than this incident, there were no other reported issues with the building prior to the collapse. Let's talk about the incident itself. At approximately 7pm on the evening of Friday the 14th of March 1986, a column on the dance floor of the nightclub was found with cracking surrounding several segments of the column. The nightclub mummy, Lily 2, contacted the nightclub manager, Philip Law, who then contacted the building owner, Mr Ng Kong Lim, to report the damage. At 9.15pm, a mirror cracked by itself without any impact to it on the nightclub level in a dressing room as one of the nightclub singers, Wei Choi Lin, was applying her makeup. At 10 past 10 in the morning of Saturday the 15th of March, Annie Quek, a bank customer, informed Albert Sim, a bank employee, that debris was falling from the ceiling in the car park below. Concerned for his vehicle that was parked below, Albert rushed down to the car park to investigate and noted that whilst his car was undamaged, there was a notable amount of debris sitting on the ground. In addition, he noted that there were two workmen under the supervision of Ng Kong Lim that were currently patching some cracking on one of the support pillars nearby. Around this time, the hotel reception also noticed spreading cracks in a column on the third floor. At 11.22am, more falling debris was observed. However, this time, it was outside the front window of the building. At 11.25am, the building began to make a low-frequency rumbling noise and then began to shake. In less than 60 seconds, columns 26 and 32 failed leading to a chain reaction as the building load was transferred to adjacent columns that also could not sustain the load and the entire building collapsed completely. Less than 10 minutes later at 11.35am, the first emergency crews arrived at the scene, joining locals already on the scene that were trying to move rubble by hand in an attempt to reach the screams of the people trapped in the rubble. Some 12 hours after the disaster, heavy machinery had been brought in and was now being employed to move the heavier rubble from the top layers of the debris in an attempt to free those trapped below. The instability of the rubble was becoming quite clear, and the somewhat disorganised rescue efforts debated whether to continue using heavy machinery. By 6am on Sunday, the 16th of March, a decision was finally made to stop using the heavy machinery, and instead... Tunnelers from the nearby subway tunnelling project voluntarily began to crawl through the ventilation access ways through the rubble to try to reach those trapped beneath. 
At 7pm, the first tunnel path collapsed and the first underground rescue tunnel had to be abandoned. By 7am on the 17th of March, a fourth tunnel attempt finally reached the first of the buried survivors. After nearly two days trapped, the first survivor was pulled from the rubble with only minor injuries. Eight people in total were rescued from the car park area. However, in total, 33 people had died. The investigation. On the 22nd of March, a week after the incident, Singapore's President Wee Kim Wee appointed a four-person commission of inquiry led by Mr Justice L.P. Thian and three other engineers, including civil engineer Terry Hume, a civil structural engineer based in Singapore, Mai Hu Kihua and Dr. H.S. Pama. Vast areas of Singapore were once swampland or reclaimed ocean, and with the new subway system expanding and construction well advanced in the area, the initial investigation started focusing on these aspects first. Drained from the 19th century onwards, this specific part of the island was originally a swampland, However, whilst soil testing after the incident showed there were some minor stability concerns, there weren't any significant ones and it was determined that it didn't contribute to the final collapse. It was also determined, however, that foundation designs were sufficient and the nearest subway tunnel under construction at that time was too far away to have any influence on the building itself. During the tunnelling and recovery exercise, it was noted that the concrete was very soft and easy to drill through. So when 240 concrete core samples were originally taken, of which 160 testable cores were viable, these were then checked for core composition and individually strength tested. All of the core samples passed and met regulatory requirements. The investigation focused then on the columns that had cracked, columns 26, 32, upon which the mirror had been mounted, and column 30, which was in the basement. Micro-cracking or micro-fractures occur when concrete is placed under high-stress loads for a very long period of time. As the investigation continued, it became clear that the building had had a long history of structural cracking, going back almost to the beginning of its use. In 1974, several rooms had developed cracks on the walls that were plastered and painted over, with some cracks as wide as 2 centimetres or nearly an inch wide. Tio Lai Huat, a renovation contractor performing works at the building between 1974 and 1984, had reported rainwater seeping into rooms 228, 328 and 428 from cracks in the roof above. The roof slab cracks were regularly patched and repatched with bitumen by the building management. In addition, Tio noticed cracking in the lobby floors, corridors and in some of the rooms when he was replacing sections of carpet. All of these concerns were reported to Ng Kong Lim. However, according to Tio, the building owner, and I quote, did not care about structural maintenance, end quote. Different renovations to the nightclub as well in the early 80s had similar findings, with cracks on columns and walls normally hidden by wooden panelling, as well as multiple doors requiring modification to allow them to open and close freely. On the 28th of May 1986, the formal hearings began and ran for several months. Upon their completion on the 13th of October 1986, the government contacted the building owners of 170 other buildings that had also been designed by the architect and engineer that had designed Hotel New World, requesting that they inspect their buildings just as a precaution. They had clearly found a potential root cause and didn't want to wait until the formal report was released before they communicated it. Before we go any further, I'd like to talk about our sponsor of this episode, and that's Clubhouse, the first project management platform for software development that brings everyone on every team together to build better products. Clubhouse was built from the outset with agile development in mind, with an intense focus on intuitiveness and responsiveness. With their web app backed by the Fastly CDN, it really feels like a local app on any platform. Clubhouse delivers developer-centric tools for everything from Kanban boards to epics, milestones, cards with different card classifications for features, bugs, and chores. But it's more Clubhouse's ability to interconnect all of them together that's so impressive. Users have reported creating less duplicates, and navigation is very fast using a common board, but with as many configurable workspaces as you like to customize that board for whatever purpose you might need. Morning stand-ups for different teams, sub-teams, or all the teams, it's up to you. Ultimately, any collaborative project management platform has to be as low friction as possible, and not just for software developers, but for everyone in the organization, marketing, support, management, you name it, the lot, so everyone can contribute and actual collaboration actually happens. 
Finally, the other part of Clubhouse that really shines is its ability to zoom out from individual tasks to the overall project status that not only keeps project managers happy, but keeps the team connected to how their part contributes to the greater project and keeps them focused on what matters, delivering a result their customers will enjoy. There are others in the market, but they're not like Clubhouse. And what makes Clubhouse so different is the balance between the right amount of simplicity without sacrificing key functionality, structured to allow genuine cross-functional team collaboration on your project. Clubhouse is a modern software-as-a-service platform with seamless integrations for popular tools like GitHub, Slack, Sentry, and lots and lots more. And if the tools that you want to integrate with aren't available out of the box, an extensible REST API in Clubhouse makes integrations straightforward. If you visit this URL, clubhouse, or one word, dot io slash 10 the word, you could take advantage of a special offer for engineered network listeners. Of course, you'll get the 14-day free trial, but if you sign up, you'll get two months free. And because this is a team-centric solution, this offer will work for your team, not just for you. This offer is only available to engineered network listeners for a limited time, so take advantage of it while you can. Thank you to Clubhouse for sponsoring the engineered network. So there were some additions to the building after it was built. In 1975, the bank built a 22-ton strong room on the ground floor. In 1978, two air conditioning towers were added to the roof. In 1982, 50 tons of exterior ceramic cladding tiles were added around the outside of the building. In early 1986, a third air conditioning tower was added on the roof. In total, approximately 100 tons of additional load was added to the building during its lifespan, none of which it had been designed to carry. Dead load is the weight of the building itself, and this includes floors, walls, columns, beams, roofs, plasterboard, carpet, doors, and so on. Live loads, on the other hand, are additional weights, like uh, people, chairs, desks, non-structural components that can be moved easily or are always moving. The calculations done by the investigative team showed that even with the additional 100 tonnes added, the additional load alone still should not have caused the pillars to give way. So let's talk about the design. The investigation found that the building's architectural plans and structural drawings were drawn up by two unqualified draftsmen, Leong Shui Lung, who primarily did the structural drawings, and Shum Chong Heng, who primarily did the reinforced concrete calculations, or RC calcs for short, as well as the RC drawings. F.J. Pastana had given the drafting for the building plans to an apprentice draftsman, Leong Shui Lung. Leong finished school in 1953 and began working for Pastana whilst he attended a formal drafting course from Singapore Polytechnic. However, he never completed that course, receiving predominantly on-the-job training. Pastana had allowed Leong to design and prepare the building design with minimal supervision, in addition, Shum Chong Heng was given the task of preparing the reinforced concrete design drawing and calculations. Shum was not a structural civil engineer. During 1968, Pastana decided to move his practice to Johor Bahru and began to wrap up his business in Singapore, leaving Leong to find work elsewhere. But Leong remained involved with the project through the managing director of Lian Yak Realty, Ng Kong Lim. Ung Kong Lim then appointed K.N. Lekshmanan to take over from Pastana following his departure, and subsequently Lekshmanan signed off on Leong's design before final submission to the chief building surveyor for approval before construction could commence. Despite Shum's inconsistent evidence provided during the investigation, the final report concluded, and I quote, We are not satisfied that they, the RC calculations, were prepared or even checked by Lekshmanan. In particular, the RC calculations were so inadequate and contained so many omissions that we find it difficult to accept that they could have been prepared by an experienced professional engineer. End quote. The planning approval was confused with multiple departments and government restructures in the time leading up to the approvals. It's commonplace to submit a design for a review and have reviewers come back with queries and then subsequent clarifications be sent in. But in this case, the load calculations weren't submitted in entirety with the design drawings to all of the reviewers until they were provided on the 12th of December 1968. When they were submitted, they were done as a matter of a checklist requirement prior to construction commencing and they were never checked against the design by the regulatory authority. Lekshmanan also had his registration cancelled in late 1968 and had his name stricken from the register of the Board of Architects in Singapore for sharing his professional fees with an unqualified person. 
That left the final submission to another structural engineer, and Leong Shulong had recommended Yi Hong Kun. In March of 1969, Yi Hong Kun notified the chief building surveyor of their intention to proceed with building work following the laying of damp-proof courses on site, which was subsequently approved, and construction began. Let's have a look, talk about the design errors themselves. There were no calculations for the basement walls, despite them being shown on drawings. The calculations showed only 9 inch by 18 inch, or 229mm by 457mm, as well as 9 inch by 24 inch, which is 229mm and 610mm dimension columns, whereas the drawings contained multiple other sizes of columns, and yet there were no calculations to support them. The calculations had similar discrepancies for the beam sizes as well as the columns, and the calculations gave the design details for a single pile cap with nine piles, whereas the drawings had designs for pile caps of two, three, four, six, and nine piles. So many were missing. The pile cap design calculation that was provided had no checks for anchorage of the reinforcement, bending moments, clear capacity, or punching shear resistance, or bursting steel. The calculations also had different slab thickness calculations than those in the design drawings. The steel reinforcements in the drawings and calculations were similarly misaligned. The conclusion the investigators reached was that there likely would have been other calculations used at some point during the design phase that were just never updated or submitted, and unfortunately, no evidence was ever found that they even existed. The dead weights of many of the structural elements in the building were well underestimated, and a large number of structural members were grossly underdesigned. Let's talk about the construction. Interestingly, the owners did not engage a main contractor, or as we would call them in Australia, a prime contractor, to undertake construction. There was no evidence that a signed building contract existed for the building. A firm called Hong Eng Construction Company was supposedly undertaking the construction effort. However, the sole proprietor of that company was Ang Ah Seng, who was in fact Ng Kong Lim's brother-in-law. A month after the report was published, the commission also noted that Ng Kong Lim, the managing director of Lian Yak, who had died in the collapse, was very much in charge of the construction of the building and carried out the supervision himself. This led to another key finding, an inconsistent construction methodology for the building, an example of which was the stabilising piles for the foundations, where the incorrect number of were installed seemingly randomly. During construction... Lekshmanan was noted to visit the structure only twice, and E approximately once per month, although there was no direct evidence that they supervised nor formally inspected the vast majority of the construction activity. Those activities were directed by Ng Kong Lim himself. The investigators also found that Ng requested to use cheaper materials during construction in an effort to reduce costs either related to cost reduction or through a lack of competent supervision, the amount of reinforcing in the final structure was found to be less than that was specified in many of the drawings. In addition, during the lifetime of the structure, any cracking was superficially treated and there was no serious structural rectification. Let's talk about the aftermath. The final report was released on the 16th of February 1987, concluding that the collapse was due to inadequate structural design of the building. In 1989, the government mandated that all structural designs must be cross-checked by accredited checkers. The Singapore Civil Defence Force, or SCDF, introduced additional training and invested in rescue equipment more suitable to collapses and engulfment to further improve their readiness for future scenarios like Hotel New World. Construction for a new seven-storey hotel on the site of the Hotel New World began on the 28th of March 1991, completing in 1994 and it is now the Fortuna Hotel, and it still stands there today. The Hotel New World Disaster Relief Fund, established by the Community Chest of Singapore, raised over 1.5 million Singapore dollars in donations from the public as well as private organisations and companies. The families of the 33 people that died in the collapse each received 24,000 Singapore dollars, with an annuity scheme worth more than 900,000 Singapore dollars was set up for the 35 children of the victims. So what do we learn from this? First of all, and perhaps foremost, supervision of engineering. Clearly, the design was predominantly carried out by unqualified people and was very poorly done. 
I'm going to quote the Professional Engineering Act from my home state, Queensland, because it's quite typical of engineering practices around the world. The PE Act states that a person can carry out professional engineering services in Queensland or for Queensland whilst unregistered if they are carrying out services under the direct supervision of an RPEQ who is responsible for the services, end quote, RPQ being Registered Professional Engineer in Queensland. But the key phrase in that is direct supervision. What Pastana, Lakshmanan and E did, that's the list of the three structural engineers involved with the project, is that they weren't directly supervising the work of either Leong or Shum. Now, if they had, it wouldn't have looked the way it did. The alternative explanation is that some of those three structural engineers should not have been on the register in the first place. Huh. And of course, Lekshmanan was struck from the register midway through and couldn't submit the plans at that point. It's so often the case that when business ebbs and flows, when you're doing design, you hire people to help and there's a lot happening. Maybe you don't have time to directly supervise them. Point being, you shouldn't be signing off their work if you're not completely confident that it's solid, correct, and accurate. If you sign off work, you're staking your reputation that it's correct, even if you didn't do the design. Supervise your people that you delegate design work to and check what they deliver and make sure it's correct before you sign it. I've refused several times in my career to sign off a design I've been harassed, bullied, and belittled for not signing off designs and calculations because I haven't been involved in their development and I haven't been given an opportunity to review them. And I don't care. I won't sign it. If your project doesn't engage accredited engineers, that's your problem, not mine. I'm not going to approve it. Anyway, take supervision and sign off seriously. Next point is construction supervision. During the investigation, it was found that the alignment of the columns and foundations and piling didn't always exactly line up, which also suggests that the surveying was done very poorly at the beginning. The piling didn't match the drawings, the reinforcing didn't either. The owner also drove the construction, and that creates other problems because there's no counterbalance. With the end owner wearing the cost directly, they can then directly choose what to cut and there is no pushback. That leads to bad decisions. With no qualified prime contractor, the lines get blurred and cutting corners becomes far too easy and is very tempting. There's certainly some parallels to the Sampung department store in this incident. Ultimately, your prime contractor needs to be independent of the client or the owner, and they need to have a proven capability to construct and be led by a qualified, experienced supervisor. And in this case, there was none of that at all. So what do we conclude? Building regulations state that architectural drawings need a secondary check done by a qualified civil engineer. Now, I mentioned this in episode 5, but, you know, the temporary bridge for the Maccabiah Games in Israel. But in case you forgot, there was a huge construction project in Brisbane. It was the duplication of the Gateway Bridge. It was only awarded for construction after three independent civil engineering firms were employed to check, recheck, and recheck again the design to ensure it was as safe as possible before it was even constructed. That's being extra cautious. Again, in episode 15 with the Sampoon department store I mentioned before in South Korea, from the perspective of a civil engineer, the structures that we build are constantly fighting gravity to stay up. It occurs to me that civil engineering is the oldest engineering discipline, and unlike the others, mechanical, electrical, electronic, and software, for example, the things that civil engineers design and construct are always fighting the elements. They're out in the elements, and they can only stand for so long. When you design a structure, it has to withstand those elements for its design life, and usually those things, particularly structures, can have dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of people inside them most of the day, every day. Designing, inspecting, and maintaining civil structures properly means that the innocent people that are in those structures won't die in the rubble when it falls on their heads. Every time you walk into a building, you know it's fighting gravity just to stay upright, and it feels solid and you trust that, but you're really trusting the designers, the architects, and those supervising construction, the materials they chose, and more. But you take it for granted. It's just a building, right? Except not all buildings are designed and built the same. And if you're a civil engineer or a structural architect, that's a huge responsibility, and you have to take it very seriously. And if you can't, then don't practice. Take up basket weaving or something. 
if you're not and you're asked to draw up a design for a structure and you know you're not competent, then don't do it. Finally, if you're inside a building with cracking happening around you, even at the very first signs of cracking, get out. Just get out and don't worry what other people might say or think. The people that worked in the Lian Yak building trusted that the building owners knew how to take care of that building and had taken their safety seriously. Some might see it as a tragic irony that Ng Kong Lim died in the collapse, being one of the main contributing drivers during the construction phase of the building, but I don't think that really helps when you consider the other 32 people that also died. They didn't deserve to. And there are some aspects of engineering that must be checked, double-checked, and checked again. And there are some corners that can never be cut. If you're enjoying Causality and want to support the show, you can via Patreon at patreon.com slash johnchigi or one word. With a special thank you to all our patrons and a special thank you to our silver producers, Carsten Hansen and John Whitlow. With an extra special thank you to our gold producer, known only as R. Patron rewards include a named thank you on the website, a named thank you at the end of episodes, access to raw detailed show notes, as well as ad-free high quality releases of every episode with patron audio now also available via individual breaker audio feeds. So if you'd like to contribute something, anything at all, there's lots of great rewards. And beyond that, it's all really, really appreciated. Beyond that, there's also other ways you can help, like leaving a rating or review on iTunes, favoriting this episode in your podcast player app of choice, or sharing the episode or the show with your friends or via social. All these things help others to discover the show and can make a huge difference. I'd personally like to thank Clubhouse for once again sponsoring the Engineered Network. If you're looking for an easy-to-use software development project management solution that everyone can use, remember, specifically visit this URL, clubhouse, all one word, io slash 10 the word to check it out and give it a try. It'll surprise you just how easy it can be. There's now a regular Q&A session and a live stream for shows on the network. You can submit questions for the Q&A with the hashtag EngNetQA on Twitter or the Fediverse or live in the IRC chat room on freenode.net on the channel hash EngNet. We hope you can join us live. Causality is part of the Engineered Network and you can find it at engineered.network with a full upcoming live show schedule now included. And you can follow me on the Fediverse at chigi at engineered.space or on the network on Twitter at engineered underscore net. This was Causality. I'm John Chigi. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you.